Good evening and thank you for joining us for this first program in an eight part series titled Adirondacks for All Identity and Environmental Justice in the North Country. It is jointly presented by the Adirondack Experience Museum, the Adirondack Diversity Initiative, the Wild Center and the Nature Conservancy. Beginning this evening and continuing every other week until early September, this series will examine the history and present day reality of the Adirondacks through an expansive lens of environmental justice. I'm Eric Reardon, Project Director, and I'd like to start this evening's program by acknowledging that the Adirondack experience is situated on the Aboriginal territories of the Mohawk and Abenaki people. Indigenous people continue to live in this region and practice their teachings and life ways. This inaugural program titled Deep History and Belonging in the Adirondacks will feature presentations from and a conversation between Kurt Steger, Dave Fadden, and Tim Messner. Kurt Steger is a scientist, educator, and author whose research deals with climate change and deep ecological histories of lakes and landscapes around the world. His work is published in prominent technical journals such as Science, as well as periodicals such as National Geographic and the New York Times. He co-hosts Natural Selections, a weekly science program on North Country Public Radio. Kurt is the author of four books, most recently Still Waters, The Secret World of Lakes. He teaches natural sciences and holds an endowed research chair at Paul Smith's College. In 2013, the Carnegie Case Foundation named him Science Professor of the Year for New York State. Dave Fadden is an artist, storyteller, and writer with strong ties to both Akwesasne and Anchayota. His subjects range from traditional Haudenosaunee teachings to instrument and inspired portrayals of community members. Fadden was recently invited to reimagine a living wetland ex uh, exhibit at the Wild Center from a Haudenosaunee perspective. Future ventures include a partnership with the John Brown Farm Historic Site and a project with Akwesasne Tourism in which he will serve as lead art consultant and designer for an outdoor community project. His work can be seen at the Six Nations Indian Museum in Anchayota, a family-run facility founded in 1954 by his grandparents. Today, he continues the work of breaking down stereotypes and advancing accurate cultural understandings of Mohawk and Haudenosaunee culture. Tim Messner is a father, a wannabe craftsman, a low-level food producer, professor, and archaeologist. His family moved to Mohawk territory in 2012 when he started teaching at SUNY Potsdam. Soon after arriving in the North Country, he became interested in the deep indigenous history of the Adirondack uplands. He has spent the last decade exploring the Adirondacks for recreational and scholarly pursuits. Throughout this evening's presentation, please feel free to submit any questions you may have through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And now I'll turn the program over to Dave Fadden. Sego, Sego, hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Fadden. <clears throat> I'm here in Alchayota, New York, in the heart of the Adirondacks. Uh, I live here part time, and I also live at Akwazaste uh, on an island called Gawanoge, right on the St. Lawrence River. Um, my real name is Ganyet uh, Tagel, and Ganyet Tagel is a name that was given to me by my great grandmother on my mother's side. And that name in English translates to mean patches of snow. I was born in March and during that time of the year, the snow melts and you have patches of snow. And so on the day I was born, there was a thaw and there was a name that fit that particular day. And that's Ganyet Tagel. I belong to the wolf clan of the Mohawk nation of Akwazasne. I was asked to start this presentation by what the Haudenosaunee people call the Ohandu Galiwadekwa, or it's the words that come before all else. It's also referred to as the Thanksgiving address. Among the Haudenosaunee, which the Mohawk are a part, at every gathering of people, whether it be political, whether it be spiritual, a wedding, a funeral, these words are always spoken first before the meeting takes place. And the purpose is to bring everyone's mind together in one voice 
and to give thanks for our existence and the existence of everything in creation. The things that keep us alive, the things that we see and appreciate every single day. Acknowledging those entities in creation and giving thanks. And it starts out by thanking all of us for being here at this gathering. And we send greetings to each and every one of you on the internet <laughs> and give thanks for our existence. And from there, we talk about the earth and when we call her our mother and because she has everything that can sustain life. And then you start at the smallest level and that's the water. And the water is probably one of the most significant things on this place, on this planet, and we wouldn't exist without it. So we send our greetings to the streams, the brooks, the ponds, the lakes, the rivers, and say thank you. As one voice, we send our greetings and thanks. And from there, we move on to the plant life, the grasses, the medicine plants that heal us, the food plants that we eat. And we send our greetings and we send our thank you. In Mohawk, they say, go. And with one collective voice, we, we send our greetings and thanks to that entity. And from there, we go to the fish that live in the water, the gadju, and we give our thanks to that. And from there, we move up to the trees, and the trees that are all around us and that give us shade in the hot summer days that we burn in the winter, that keeps us warm, that makes our shelters, that keeps the rain off our heads, and we give thanks to the trees. And from the trees, we go to the animals, all the animals that live in the forest that we see now and again, the deer, the bear, the wolf, the coyote, the fox, the woodchuck, all those animals, we collectively in one mind, greet them and say thank you. And then moving up from there, we look to the sky, we see the clouds coming from the west. In the distance, we hear a rumble of thunder. In Mohawk, they say, Latiwelos or our grandfathers. We give thanks for the thunder and the rain that comes and replenishes all the lakes, the streams and the rivers. And so with one voice, we send greetings and thank you to that, our grandfathers. And from our grandfathers, we move up even further with the birds where we say, Uchidana, and all the birds that bring happiness to us, that we hear their songs as we wander around. Even this morning, I sat on my porch and I could hear the hermit thrush singing. It's probably one of the most beautiful songs you can hear in the forest. And my grandfather always said that when he sings, the sun shines brightly in your heart. It just makes you feel good. So we send greetings collectively as one, with one voice and give thanks to the Ojidana or the birds. And moving up, we look to the sky, we see the moon what we call Golakwa, and the moon is our grandmother. And our grandmother oversees all female life forms. Babies are born accordingly to our grandmother as she goes in the sky. So we send greetings and we send thanks to our grandmother, the moon. Next is the sun. The sun we refer to as our elder brother. And our elder brother is so bright and it brings us heat and warmth. And we send greetings and thanks to our elder brother, the sun. From there, we look to the stars and the constellations that guide us at night as we travel. And they say that the stars, they bring dew to the grass in the morning. And we send greetings and we send thank you to the stars. And all those things collectively is part of our existence. And as one collective voice, we just offer our thanks to that. And with that is the end of a short, short version of the Ohanu Galiwadekwa. And usually it's done in a Mohawk language or another nation's language, but I did it in English so that you could understand. Now I'm going to pass it over to Kurt. And Kurt's going to give his presentation. Now we'll go. Thanks so much for that, Dave. I'll just give a little um, background to what we're talking about here. Um, I'll start a little PowerPoint here uh, just to make sure everything's working.
And I'll ask uh, somebody to volunteer in the group to speak up and let me know if you can see this slide that says, what is the history of the Adirondacks? And that you can also hear my voice. Anybody hear me? All set? Okay. So one of the things we're asking when we ask, a, when we talk about belonging here and things, uh, there's a fundamental question and that's, um, you know, who are Adirondackers and what is the Adirondacks? And when I got here four decades ago, the narrative I took in was it's still widespread. It's um, a lot of it stems from sources like this book in the upper left. It's called uh, A History of the Adirondacks by Alfred Donaldson. Uh, he wrote it 100 years ago. He wasn't a historian or anything like that, but it perpetuates this idea that the history of the Adirondacks started just a couple centuries ago with white people showing up, um, being lumberjacks, trappers. Uh, there's And the uh, history of the Adirondacks is all about the trains, the, the great camps, the guides, and things like that. Um, and of course, then what goes with that is, well, you know, what was here before? And what this basically white supremacist narrative says is um, there really wasn't a history until the white people showed up, um, that the indigenous folks didn't really live up here. And um, you may have heard of this yourself. You can still hear it today. Um, the narrative goes basically, um, they didn't live up here because of all these supposed reasons, such as it was too harsh and cold up here for them. Uh, there was nothing up here for them anyway. Uh, that probably is related to this idea that it's too hard to grow crops here and uh, indigenous folks needed to grow their crops. And so why in the world would they even come here? They were just trying to get out of the place as quickly as they could if, they're, if they were here at all. Um, so basically, uh, rather than living up here, they were only passing through. And so um, this actually fits <laughs> with a, a convenient historical narrative as well. Uh, because it basically says uh, the Indians didn't really live up here. They weren't using it, so we took it. Um, so um, this is not just something that dates back to Donaldson. His book came out 100 years ago. Uh, it's on a lot of bookshelves. People read it quickly. It's easy to read. And that narrative is in there. Well, that narrative showed up almost word for word just a week ago on a recent podcast by this person right here. Um, other folks drew my attention to it, and uh, yep, it's, it's, it's still there alive and well on this podcast. I, well, this person also has a book, I guess, uh, that he's going to be coming out with, uh, self-published, about this history. Um, uh, and it's not just necessarily um, lack of knowledge, but it's uh, this person even added in their podcast. There are some who disagree with this, um, but those who do kind of don't know what they're talking about. So I'd like to challenge that tonight with some people who really do know what they're talking about, including Tim Messner, who we're going to hear from later. Uh, known Tim for a long time, and um, he's brought me out into the field with some of his archaeological work. Here's just uh, one example of a, a site uh, in Indian Lake that uh, we came to, and he was unearthing a hearth. These are boiling stones that you'd heat up and use for cooking. Uh, we carbon dated the charcoal around it, and uh, it came out to uh, about a thousand years ago. So uh, that's when Vikings were colonizing Greenland. Okay, so to say there were no indigenous people here before the white folks just a couple centuries, here's a thousand year old site of people, you know, cooking their meals here. Um, so these kinds of experiences got me hooked, and as a sideline to my own ecological research, I've been keeping an eye. Uh, for artifacts when I'm traveling in the region and also collecting as many reports from regular folks, documents and things um, where artifacts have been found in the Adirondack uplands. And uh, this is a map, this entire region here is the Adirondack Park. And uh, these dots are places that I've found so far. There's about three dozen of them. Um, and uh, some of you may have found some things too. So to say that there were no people here is uh, demonstrably false. Um, the other argument, oh, it was too cold up here, is kind of silly to think of, right? I mean, these folks, their ancestors walked here from Siberia during an ice age, okay? <laughs> there's, um, there's a projectile point found in Tupper Lake 
10 to 13,000 years old. Um, it was tundra here when that person was hunting with that. So um, basically the, the human presence dates back older than the trees around here, back when it was parkland tundra and even colder than it is now. So we've got thousands of years of that. Um, the argument, oh, there was nothing up here for them. Well, there was plenty of hunting and fishing year round. Uh, Melissa Otis, who might be with the group tonight, also uh, writes extensively about this. And uh, one of the other many important uses of this region was as a place of refuge from plague, from battles, from racism and, and other problems. You, um, I, I think it's entertaining to hear somebody say, oh, um, up in the mountains, uh, indigenous people couldn't raise their crops. There's no, you can't grow corn up here. And then you turn around <coughs> and drive down the road and spend the afternoon at the great Adirondack corn maze. You know, isn't that kind of interesting, right? Yes, you can grow crops here. Um, there are places with plenty good soil. The climate is not that much colder than the lowlands. And of course, back in the past, there could have been local indigenous strains of these crops that handled it just fine. So I've also been working with Dave and honored to do that and, and uh, multiple generations of his family too. Uh, they've been working on this for a long, long time with the Cultural Center and uh, Dave and I have been collaborating on a, a technical paper about ancient dugout canoes from the region, including this 20 foot long monster here. Um, you don't just pass through the region with a gigantic dugout like this. It's too heavy to use on a stream. This was made at Twin Ponds centuries ago and was for use on Twin Ponds, multiple use. And there are first person accounts of indigenous folks living up here in the winter too. So I'd like to close here just by encouraging us to expand our sense of history. And it's hard to do. I mean, time is invisible, right? Um, but I, I like to try to find ways to help us visualize the depth of this human history in the, in the Adirondacks. So I figured let's, let's make a little icon here for a human lifetime and we'll make the math easy. We'll say that's a 50 year average lifetime for a person. So um, here's five of these in a row, five lifetimes end to end would be since the American revolution when the standard white supremacist narrative says history began here. So let's see this string of history here. Let's compare that to what reality is, okay? That's the time since maize began to be cultivated in this region by indigenous peoples. This is the span of time, human lifetimes, since pottery arrived, all indigenous folks in the Adirondacks. And this is the number of lifetimes since people originally arrived. So it's a deep, rich history, most of it not written on paper, but it's just as real as if it had been. And on top of that, um, of course, indigenous folks still live here, as we can see for ourselves. So um, I'm going to just close with that to try to help get things rolling. And I'm sure we'll have uh, plenty of fodder for comments afterwards, but I'd like to pass it back to Dave, if you wouldn't mind taking it from here. Oh, thank you, Kurt. Uh, that was awesome. And that, uh, <clears throat> that presentation just reflects what I've heard my whole life, that uh, the, the notion that it's, uh, it's tough here, tough to live, it's cold, it's, uh, the bugs are awful and the winters are long. And, and I just never believed it because I grew up here. You know, the winters are cold, but it's beautiful and I love it. I just wear more clothes. We prepare, we get our firewood wet ready for the winter. Uh, you know, of course, today is different. And keep in mind that today, the demographics is in the winter time, most people leave and they go back to their, their winter homes in the cities and they, a lot of them come up to the mountains to go to their camps or hike. And, but they always go back down to the valleys to wherever their cities and villages are. But there's still always a hardy folks that stay here their whole lives today. And I'm assuming, and I would be willing to bet a lot of money 
that there were indigenous folks that loved it here too during the winter. If they say it's too, it's too tough to live, I just never believed it. My grandfather, he was born in 1910. He lived here, he grew up here. He had a different life than I do. I grew up with television and look now today, I got a cell phone. Uh, if I need something, I get on Amazon, touch by touch of a button and it's here. Back in my grandfather's day, it was a lot more difficult. And you had a lot of more preparations for the winter, a lot of work. His father and his father's father, it was drastically different. They were blacksmiths, they were farmers, they were loggers. It was all, you know, very, very labor intensive life to survive here in, in, during those times in the 1800s. Those guys are tough very very tough and they develop the skill sets that you need to survive and if you go further back when it was just indigenous people here those people were highly skilled individuals to survive out in the woods in the forest to understand how the natural world works what to eat when to harvest when to hunt how to prepare your uh, food for preservation over the winter, you think ahead. And then it gets cold, but I live at Akwazasni too. And I think it's colder there sometimes. I live right on the St. Lawrence. That wind whips right through my jacket. And sometimes it's colder than it is here. It's, it's very cold. The temperature's about the same. <clears throat> no, that blanket statement that indigenous people didn't live here. I'm sure there were no cities. There was no great metropolis, but I have a, a feel and a suspicion that there were smaller communities of, of families that just loved it here, like I do. And um, in order to survive, again, you need those skill sets. And my father remembers, there was a guy, I think he, he lived near Indian Lake and uh, his name was Spike Draper and he was uh, Seneca. <laughs> and he had a little training post. This is, you know, probably back in the early 50s. And he was an older gentleman, native guy. He used to be a guide in the Adirondacks. But he had the skills to survive out in the woods. And he would talk about it and he would teach. So finally, the local community told, asked him, or in their discussion said, there's no way could you survive out in the woods with just a knife. You, you wouldn't last a month. And so they made a bet. And so he took on that bet and the challenge was is to go into the forest with just a knife and come back to the village in 30 days to see if you could survive just with a knife. And so he agreed to the challenge and they even weighed him. They got his weight. And so he grabbed his knife and he disappeared in the forest. 30 days later, he came out healthy and happy and they weighed him and he actually gained weight out in the woods. He had those skills to survive. Now, that's a common theme that I've always heard. And uh, at our place here in Anchayota, it's uh, now called the Six Nations Iroquois Cultural Center. And formerly the Six Nations Indian Museum, we have recently become a not-for-profit organization. And we have big plans on expanding our building to a, a newer building and you know, with climate control and um, using utilizing all green technologies and so it's a really exciting time for us but in our small collection these are artifacts that would just happen by accident or found by accident that we have a pottery bowl and i can share my screen real quick no i don't think it's going to work no but anyways we have a pottery bowl that was found by accident by a hunter and the story is that he was this hunter, he was a prison guard in Danamora, and he was, uh, he lived in Silver Lake. And that's maybe a 15 minute drive from here in the mountains. And he was hunting during one fall. And apparently the weather got uh, kind of miserable. It was like a rain, snow mix. And, and so he needed to find shelter and he found this rock shelter, you know, a big giant rock that fell a million years ago. And he ducked underneath that rock to get out of the weather. And as he looked around, he found just a little piece of this thing with leaves and he dug the leaves out. 
and he found a powdery ball it was decent size so he took it home and put it in a box and put it in the attic and kind of forgot about it and in 1954 is when my grandfather built the museum and this gentleman had uh was retiring he's going to sell his house and he's going to move south <clears throat> and he happened to stumble upon his pottery bowl that he found he really didn't know what it was or the significance of it <clears throat> and so he came up to my grandfather's place pulled in the driveway and talked to my grandfather and he says i found this thing in silver lake and uh do you want it and his grandfather's like what is it and so he went out guy opened his trunk opened up the box and my grandfather's eyes must have popped right out of his head and he goes, where'd you find this? And he goes, it's Silver Lake Mountain, right at the base of the mountain. It was mostly intact, but there were a few pieces missing. And my grandfather said, can you show me where? And sure. And so they hiked back to the spot and he found some more pieces of pottery. Then he put it together and it's been in a display case in our museum ever since. <laughs> but as Kurt pointed out, pottery has been here for a long time. And when the Europeans did arrive, pottery more or less faded into history because we started to trade for uh, iron kettles, brass kettles, items like that. And so pottery just kind of just disappeared. So that predates the contact with European. It's very old. And the size of it also suggests a lot of people because with a vessel of that size would hold a lot of food either for storage or for cooking. And if you're just passing through these mountains, you're not carrying a big pottery bowl on your back. There are methods of carrying uh, meat or anything. They use a tump line, either over their head or over their shoulders. And it was a wooden frame on your back with a, a platform where you'd set your items on and you would wrap it. And that's how you would carry items. You would never carry a pot that size. Plus it would probably break, they're, they're a little fragile. And so to find something like that is very significant. And that's just down the road from here. And there's other artifacts that were found, uh, say Regis Mountain. There was a uh, pottery shards that were found, like again, some more pottery. Uh, True Brook uh, in Redford, it's just in the mountains are starting. Uh, flint knives were found. Uh, Fran Yardley found some artifacts on, I uh, can't remember the name of the brook, or Bartlett's Carry, that's where she found these artifacts. Uh, Jim Bickford, he found pottery. And these are all artifacts that were just found by mistake, just stumbled upon. Most people would walk right over these artifacts not knowing what it is because they don't have a trained eye. They just think it's a, another rock or some kind of piece of clay. They don't know how to identify these items. And um, I'll leave you with one last comment or uh, anecdote. My father went to a conference a number of years ago and there was a professor, I think his name was Thomas. He was from UVM in Vermont. And he put on a, a presentation about the habitation, uh, mostly of Vermont. And I believe he was an archeologist and he threw up the slide on the screen and it was a map and you would see Vermont, the Green Mountains and you'd see Lake Champlain, then you'd see the Adirondacks. And on the Vermont side, it was just loaded with all these dots that identified the village sites and other archeological dig sites where they found uh, plentiful artifacts all over the Green Mountains. And if you're familiar with the Green Mountains, they're very similar to the Adirondacks. And so as he was looking at that map, my father looked at the Adirondacks and there was just a handful, one or two or three, and they're all along the lake, which is natural because we live near water as well. <clears throat> my father raised his hand and asked a question. And he said, he pointed that out. He said, why is there's hardly any sites in the Adirondacks? And that professor just simply stated, he said, well, I work at University of Vermont and we study our own backyard and we just don't have the resources nor the, the staffing to go across the lake for you know expeditions to look for artifacts. And that's one of the only reasons. And now 
those dots are getting more numerous as according to Kurt's uh, diagram there and also Tim Messner's work start to identify uh, other sites. And there's another uh, guy by the name of Kellogg. He did a study on Lake Champlain along the shore, looking at artifacts. Then he started to follow the rivers. He went up the Osable River, up the Saranac, and he kept finding more and more artifacts that led all the way up to the mountains. And he continued to find numerous artifacts. And he has, um, I believe, has a paper out on that. And so the evidence is there, and all the evidence that we have found has been found by accident. <clears throat> and so from my, in my own belief, is just that we've been here for a long, long time. Maybe not like a, a big city, but if, there's, if people thought and saw the beauty of these mountains the way I do today, and I'm sure all of you as well, those people a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, would have loved these mountains as well. And with that, uh, uh, I guess I pass it on to Tim. Now we'll go. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. Hello, folks. I am going to share my screen. Bear with me one moment. Someone want to give me a thumbs up that we're everybody can see what I can you see what I see? Kurt, thank you, sir. Awesome. Okay, so I'm Tim Messner. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about this story, right? This story that we've heard a lot about this evening, this idea, this unsettling notion that prior to the arrival of Euro-Americans that the Adirondacks were uninhabited, right? That indigenous peoples didn't live in the Adirondacks. So for the last decade, uh, I've been interested in this question, right? People have been all around the Northeast, all around the world, why not in the Adirondacks? So I've conducted archeological excavations. Uh, we're gonna talk a bit about that, but we're gonna hone in on three themes as we go here. We're going to hone in on notions, concepts related to home, the power of stories, and how they influence people's sense of belonging. So as I said, you know, I've been working in the Adirondacks for close to a decade. Um, I've been fortunate to collaborate, work with uh, descended communities, to speak with um, various people at fine institutions, the Adirondack Experience, New York State Museum. Um, and I've learned a great deal, right, of what the Six Nations Cultural Center has in their collections to hear from the Faddens, as you just heard from Dave, about their stories, um, to talk to the good people at Aquasasne Cultural Center. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what I've learned, right? A whirlwind exploration of the Adirondacks in 10 minutes, 10,000 years in 10 minutes, and then reflecting on these ideas of home, on stories, and on belonging. Um, so part of my research has involved reaching out and tracking down artifact collectors, right? Who's found things accidentally, as Dave just explained. Many archaeological sites are found by accident. So here you see a gentleman's collection and what's on that display case is over 7,000 years of indigenous history. Um, so in looking at this history, right, we got to begin a little earlier than 7,000 years. As Kurt pointed out, the Adirondack history truly begins when the ice clears. And we're talking about 15,000 years ago, the glacier pushes north of the Adirondacks. And you can see south of that glacier, all these dots and these names, those are archeological sites dating to about 15,000 years ago. Fast forward about 13,000 years ago, the glacier is further north. And again, we see many dots, um, but none in the Adirondacks continue. The glacier continues to retreat north, many, many dots, none in the Adirondacks but the map doesn't reflect reality. Meaning, as Kurt pointed out, the oldest site, the oldest artifact recovered from the Adirondacks, to my knowledge, 
is this one right here. This is a fluted spear point, perhaps the end of a spear, perhaps the end of an atlatl dart tip. Um, this was a tool used by hunting and gathering peoples, meaning these folks were highly mobile. They made their living by moving, right? And moving into the Adirondacks. Why? Well, that's a good question. The megafauna, the mastodons and mammoths are long gone, but the charismatic megafauna known as the caribou are still alive and well. Perhaps they were in pursuit of these caribou. Um, time goes on. We see the Middle Holocene. Many archaeological sites dating to this time period, there's a greater diversity in artifact type, right? Your stone tool technology changes. These, again, are spear tips, they're knives, they're atlatl dart tips. Um, and we see people hunkering down. Folks are spending more time in one place. They're putting in roots, uh, meaning they're becoming more territorialized, moving still, still moving, but tending their environment, tending the wild. Why is that important? Well, this is a, a climactic episode known as the hypothermal, which is a fancy way of saying things are getting nice, right? The ice age is long behind us in the rear view mirror. Things are getting warm. And contrary to this notion that all folks had to eat was tree bark, there would have been a wide range of animals present in these forests. What kind of animals? Certainly white-tailed deer, the iconic Adirondack moose, but also caribou, sorry, also elk in the foothills of the Adirondacks, a wide variety of fur-bearing animals, black bear, beaver, etc. Um, in the rivers and streams, the salmonoids, brook trout, lake trout, white fish, perch. Uh, the birds, can't forget the birds. Who doesn't love the iconic Adirondack loon? Um, and we can't forget the plants. These forests may have been much more diverse than we give the modern forest credit for. Two botanists from the New York State Museum and studying an old growth forest in the Southern Adirondacks identified hundreds of different taxa. So what I did was I looked them all up in Daniel Mormon's uh, Native American Ethnobotany database. And what I found was that over a hundred have traditionally been used in indigenous pharmacopoeia. These are medicinal plants. Many have been used as food. Many have been used for utilitarian purposes. Clearly, it wasn't the starving ground this common narrative has led us to believe. I had the privilege to excavate an archaeological site in the Tupper Lake region, this one dating to between five to 7,000 years ago. We recovered a wide range of artifacts, different sorts of stone tools, had a lot of dart tips, blades, but also woodworking tools not shown here, a ground stone axe fragment shown here, a trifacial drill, uh, fishing weight. Um, time goes on. We enter the middle to late Holocene. And again, this is a map published showing all sorts of archaeological sites dating to this time period, none of which occur in the Adirondacks. These folks, again, are highly mobile, still hunting and gathering, though at the end of this range, folks are starting to farm. Um, we see for the first time, Kurt mentioned pottery, right? We see for the first time pottery and we see for the first time other sorts of non-perishable containers, meaning soapstone, right? Steatite vessels. And we see sites dating to this time period in the Adirondacks. Uh, here we have a metalwood cash blade on the right-hand side, currently at the Adirondack Experience, same, uh, stylistically point, a uh, point stylistically dating to the same interval. Um, and a soapstone vessel recovered from the Indian Lake area, also in the Adirondack Experiences collection. Had the honor to excavate another site dating to this time period, found a wide variety of 1500 year old ceramics, a couple of them shown here, as well as chipstone tools, this one in the center, 
likely was used for processing hides. What kind of hides? Well, there was an amazing faunal collection, black bear, beaver, white-tailed deer, and some fishes. Um, we enter the late Holocene. And again, we can see the traditional homelands, Haudenosaunee, uh, and other sorts of folks, uh, Mohican and Abenaki. Um, this is the time period when the bow and arrow becomes the hottest thing, maize-based agriculture, and longhouses amongst the Haudenosaunee, nucleated villages. And again, we look at this map, there's nothing shown for the Adirondacks. But if we look at the Adirondacks through this lens, there are many sites in the Adirondacks dating to this period of time. This is pottery, this would be the collar, think of a shirt, right? Highly decorated collars on these big, beautiful ceramic vessels, ceramic smoking pipes, other sorts of pottery. These were recovered from Long Lake, I do believe. Um, and whole pots. So Dave mentioned the pot at the cultural center. I believe that's the Silver Lake pot shown at the bottom, but there are others, right? And this is interesting. I don't wanna get bogged down, but as Dave pointed out, big heavy vessels really don't suggest hunting camps, right? Six dudes in a canoe, right? What do they suggest? They suggest a longer term occupation, men, women, children spending a long period of time in the uplands. At Long Lake, as, uh, as Kurt pointed out, um, people are building their environment. We see features, my archeologists use this term feature, immovable artifacts. This one is a cooking structure, a cooking apparatus, earthen oven, fire pit, um, dating to about 950 years ago. Again, I had the honor to excavate a hamlet, this in the speculator region um, of the Adirondacks. And again, we're finding evidence of long-term occupation, ceramics, evidence of fishing equipment, uh, arrowheads, such as you see here. In my mind, I imagine, again, a hamlet, something perhaps that may have looked something like this. What does this mean? What does all this mean? Here we reflect back on those three items, those three themes, this notion of home, right? This notion of home, what does it mean? It means that people have been living in the Adirondacks for a very long time, right? It forces us to think critically about this notion of home, right? This settler colonial notion of where people live. For the greatest portion of human history, folks moved, right? We didn't call home one place. You didn't write it on an envelope. You called home a region, a watershed. It's a different sort of relationship. And it reminds me, right? So you know, this, 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 this iconic animal, the Adirondack moose, I, I can't see you people. It's kind of like when I'm teaching on Zoom, I can't see the class, but I know you're out there. And I don't think you would argue with me that the moose lives in the Adirondacks, right? But clearly the moose doesn't listen to these geopolitical borders, these blue lines. Moose, you know, have been seen down in West Westchester County, perhaps at a coffee shop in Yonkers. Um, the moose moves. Similarly, the iconic loon, um, Again, what would the Adirondacks be without the loon? Uh, it too moves, right? It relies on this notion of migratory connectivity. Um, this, is, this is interesting, right? Because we have no problem recognizing the moose or the loon's attachment to the Adirondacks, but I would ask then why, why then do we set a different standard for people? And I would answer <laughs> loon, the loon and the moose, Right? They don't complicate the colonizers' property regimes. And furthermore, by delegitimizing indigenous people's history or their presence in the Adirondacks, it strengthens this hyper-masculine story of white people conquering the primordial Adir Adirondack forest. And I would caution us, right? These stories are powerful. Um, Thomas King, I feel, puts it best when he says, the truth about stories is that's all we are. 
we need to be careful because these stories influence people and their sense of belonging. And furthermore, I would put forth this notion that we need to unsettle. We need to unsettle this dominant narrative, this colonizer's narrative that the Adirondack uplands were unsettled. So, thank you. And I'll now turn the mic back over to Kurt. Wow, thanks. <laughs> um, looks like we, we have maybe 15 minutes and uh, rather than me hogging the Q&A time, I, I see some people are writing into chat and Q&A and uh, we have a pretty big audience. Um, Eric, what do you think of opening it up to the audience? Yeah, feel free to go ahead and, and uh, open up the Q&A. We have a couple questions already here. Um, one is from Ray Curran. One thing I'm interested in as a forest ecologist is Native American manipulation of habitats for their benefit. Burns, introduction of bur oak, crop like maize. Kurt, what evidence do we have for that in remnant plant communities, ecological histories or otherwise? Mike Curtis has been looking in these issues in the Catskills. And a question for Dave, what about the uh, traditions and oral record? What does that say? Dave, you wanna go first? Uh, sure. Um, that first thing I thought of was uh, my brother's name. I mean, his Mohawk name is uh, Tehonadag. And uh, Tehonadag in English means he has two towns. We understood that when you clear a space, clear land, and you have your village, you don't want to overuse it or damage it in any way. And so you would live there, build your homes for about a generation, maybe 20 years, or maybe a little more. Then it'd go down, maybe a mile or two away, clear another area, you burn it. You have your gardens, you have your, you build your homes, but you, you don't move overnight. It's not like you put down a deposit and you move in the next day. So it takes time. In a sense, you'll have two towns. And that's his name, Tehonad. And it's that, that notion that you leave that, your old village, so that the earth can replenish it and the trees can regrow and you don't overuse it and damage it in any way. And so as far as oral traditions, there's stories about, um, there's a legend about a family that went north. They were from the Mohawk Valley and they went into the mountains. They meandered and they found houses, longhouses. And of course, it's a scary story. And uh, it was an abandoned uh, house, this one, they went in and there was a skeleton that came to life and terrorized these people. I won't tell you the whole story, that's for a campfire, but it's the idea that they went to the mountains and they found a, a, a longhouse. And in the story, they describe it more like, like almost like a cabin, not a longhouse. Like <clears throat> historical records in uh, some of the villages, like one at Onondaga in particular, there was a longhouse that was excavated um, where they find remnants of the posts in the ground and they would mark it. This particular longhouse was 400 feet long. And so that was a lot of people that lived in that one house. And so, like I mentioned before, the idea that, you know, I don't know what these uh, uh, people are looking for, like uh, a big city. There were no big cities. There were like hamlets, little towns, maybe four or five families. Uh, that would live here year round and it can sustain it. You know, you, you can sustain yourself there. Um, and uh, another oral tradition is that our people, uh, what we know as the Haudenosaunee or the, the, the Six Nations originally came from along the Mississippi River thousands of years ago. And that we, in the story, it goes that we were friends and brothers of the, the wolf people or also known as the Pawnee. And for some reason, we just started to move. We followed the rivers, went up to Ohio, made it to the Great Lakes. And it was there they met a people they called uh, Anadaks or Latilundaks. And that's where you get the word Adirondack. In, uh, in English, that means bark eaters. And it was almost like a slang to say that those people were such horrible hunters that they had to eat bark. But we didn't get along with those people at first. 
in fact, they outnumbered us and um, we were more or less prisoners for some time. And then they scattered about, they ran and they ultimately ended up uh, along the St. Lawrence and along down the Oswego River. And the main villages were along those rivers, as, you, as Tim's maps pointed out. Those are easy to find, you know, they're all clear. There's a, no dense forest there to find these these places. But common sense would say, you know, just follow the river, you know, follow the racket, find a spot where there's good wind where it keeps the bugs away. And if you just dig a little bit, I'm sure you'll find some artifacts. But, um, and another thing I wanted to point out or mention was that the name of Adirondacks, I don't know who coined it. Uh, it's, a, it's a Mohawk word, Anahadaks or Latelun ducks, that means bark eater or porcupine. But how we say it was a Jonatasco, and all that simply means is tall hills. And uh, I was talking to a, a fluent Mohawk speaker about the root of that word. And there's a word called uh, Anunda, and that means milk. And then in more discussion, I said, why would they name Jonatasco after milk? And he says, breasts because of the, the way the, they look, they remind them of breasts, or in Mohawk, the word is milk. And there's an effort being um, undertaken right now by a, a, a woman from Kahnawake Reservation near Montreal, and she teaches at Carleton University in Ottawa. They want to do a, a map of all indigenous place names, and that includes the Adirondacks. And we have names for these places. And, so she's working on a database of all of these places, you know, certain rivers, brooks, streams, as much as they can. And so that's an ongoing effort. Tim, you have anything? Uh, it's a, an interesting question. And I think you know, European land use history has certainly changed the landscape considerably. Uh, the history of logging, the fire regimes that have moved through has altered you know, the vegetational composition. But it still would be interesting to look at what kind of plants are growing near these archaeological sites, right? Are these holdover populations from when people, you know, would gather and bring them back and prepare their foods? And lo well, and behold, you would establish a garden that you either tend or don't. Um, but yeah, fascinating question. Lots of work to be done. I'll just mention real quickly, there's just so much work to do and not that many people to do it. So um, as far as legacies of human use in the forests around here and the species, we just haven't had a lot of examinations there. Uh, my work looks at sediment cores. We have found charcoal records in different lakes, Wolf Lake, Paseco Lake and others. There's no consistent pattern in the timing, which suggests it's not just a climate signal where it got dry and everything burned, but could have been local residents, but that's not conclusive. We've also looked for maize pollen and haven't found it yet, but that doesn't mean it wasn't there. So um, there's just a lot of work still to be done in that. Eric, you wanna pick something out of the... There's so many great questions here. I'm sorry we can't get to all of them, but um, here's one that strikes me on from Lorraine Duval. Tim, you spoke of home and migratory connectivity of indigenous peoples, of moose, loons, et cetera. How would you speak of secondary homeowners in the Adirondacks and their modern migratory connectivity? I don't know. <laughs> um, excellent question, right? The Adirondacks are, yeah. <laughs> you still have people who winter summer in the uplands and return to other locations um yeah i don't know if i'm answering that well or <laughs> talk to a local adirondack or they'll say they don't really live here right or one way i try to think of it maybe to put what dave's saying and tim also is uh you know you live in your house right but you don't spend all your time in one of the rooms. You don't spend all your time in your pantry, but you know, is it your home? Yeah. So, you know, you move around in there and then you can argue about who belongs or how long you have to be here to be a local. 
It's another great question uh, from Jennifer Mitchell. Dave said, those settlements are easy to find out in the open. Do you think archaeologists were just working around the mountains due to factors in their discipline or the difficulty of locating sites in the Adirondacks? Um, it's probably both. You know, it is, uh, like I said earlier, it's, you know, you've got to use common sense a lot of times. It's like, where would you want to live? Would you want to live in a bog where there's mosquitoes? Or would you want to live out near a lake where there's a nice breeze that blows them away? And also the plant life, you know, is there an abundance of certain plants that grow and um, maybe the animals, there's a lot of deer, certain areas, beaver. Um, and as far as, you know, archaeologists and what the work Tim is doing, a lot of times you find out, you, you meet people that they, they found an artifact somewhere. And then Tim will say, where'd you find that? And they'll take him to the spot and then start digging. But to find you know, like there was a funny story of a guy who was this same topic was brought up about uh, and this another anthropologist basically says, yeah, there was absolutely no habitation in the Adirondacks. It's just that that was a fact. That's what he understood. There's a guy from Onondaga. And he says, you know, he says, there's artifacts found. He said, oh, that doesn't suggest permanent habitation. And then the guy just, the Onondaga guy just looked at him and says, well, what are you looking for, an ark? You know, he's like, what are you looking for, a pyramid? You know, just common sense is that you have, just like today, you have a hamlet, Saranac Lake, a hamlet on Chayota. They're small. And it's, you know, why would it be no different back then? And just as far as finding these places, it's just common sense where you look. Where would you want to be? I think we have time for one more question here, another great one. Um, I've been told that some of the major routes we travel are there because they're originally trails made by indigenous people. Is this true? And if so, why are there no historical markers pointing this out along the roadsides? It's a good point. Uh, I know all the throughways and the north way, those are all trails. In our tradition, we had runners that were trained specifically to deliver messages to the uh, different nations and communities. And they say that these young men were trained as, uh, you know, teenagers, probably 16, 17 years old, uh, extremely fit, and they were runners. And you would carry a string of wampum that gave you the authority to deliver a message. And they take off running, and they say it would take three days to run from Albany to Buffalo. And that's like, was that uh, 90 that goes across? That's where that highway is. We know where to go. All the roads that you, you travel on now are old indigenous trails. But the, the main mode of transportation, of course, was the canoe in the rivers. But there are trails that go around, and those became roads. Yeah, I'll just add something too. Uh, Tim pointed out to me like, stuff's right in front of our faces and we don't necessarily see it until your eyes are open right like what's that pass in the middle of the high peaks indian pass i mean that's like the direct route right through the mountains why'd they call it that i, I can't imagine why as for why there are no signs marking these locations, right? Commemorating this place. This very much is a product of settler colonialism and the fact that it's an ongoing process, right? We erase what was before and then we build stories about Euro-Americans being the first. And I can add one more thing to that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of this, you know, the idea, the notion that well, there are no people here, so we may as well take it. You know, that just justifies the theft. You know, they're, they're marching in and um, pushing the people out. And, uh, and that's why I love, you know, the educational system, uh, the, the psyche of the, uh, the American public is, is, is a really negative history about Native people. In reality, you know, we're humans, we do bad things. All people do. You know, maps change. You know, look at Europe what's going on right now in the Ukraine, those lines will change. And I saw an animation of uh, Europe, I think it was about a thousand years and all the borders that changed 
unbelievable. You know, empires came and went. You know, things evolve, things change. And uh, but in this country, in a lot of cases, it the, the narrative that they they come up with justifies a horrible in, uh, injustice. It's like, ah, oh, they didn't live there anyway. It's too cold. That's why we took it. My grandfather always said, and I heard this numerous times, it soothes the conscience to cast mud upon the character of a people you have wronged. So call them savages, primitive. That justifies the horrible injustice. Thank you so much, Dave, Tim, and Kurt for this, this great presentation. And thank, uh, thank you everyone out there for, for tuning in this evening. Uh, we really do appreciate it. I just wanna note that um, we would invite you to join us two weeks from tonight, June 14th at 7 p.m. for our next program, which is titled Adirondack Equality, 19th Century Black Settlement and Environmental Justice in the North Country. Link, uh, a link to register for that program that you can find um, in the chat of this webinar. Um, thank you again so much for attending and uh, we hope to see you next time. Thank you everyone. Good night.